This is a story about the parotid gland and how it gets its cranial nerve, maybe. So I've threatened in the past about doing a video on the four parasympathetic ganglia of the head. That's what we're doing today. And the parotid gland I think is particularly interesting because it's associated with a number of cranial nerves, but only one actually innovates it with parasympathetic stuff to make it, you know, secrete. So what we'll do is, is we'll work out where the nerve comes from and how it gets there. But the otic ganglion is the one parasympathetic ganglion that we're going to talk about today. All right. So there are four parasympathetic ganglia in the head on either side. We've got ciliary, otic, pterygopalatine, and submandibular. I'm not feeling too good today, so we'll see what my brain's like, all right? Uh, the otic ganglion is the ganglion for today. And um, before we move on to the next page, I need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Let's do a bit of housekeeping in terms of autonomic nervous system structure. Right, so. Sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. They're all motor to structures. They might be, uh, so sympathetic neurons are often vasomotor. That is, they innervate the smooth muscle of a blood vessel, causing it to constrict and restricting blood flow somewhere. Uh, parasympathetic is often um, secretomotor. It tells some, um, maybe it tells some, so it tells a gland to maybe secrete whatever it's been storing up. And today, of course, we're talking about salivation and the parotid glands. Now, most parasympathetic neurons, um, this is just the way that we're wired. We have a preganglionic parasympathetic neuron coming out of the central nervous system somewhere. So that's about one neuron. It starts in the central nervous system, and sends its axon out. Now in many cases around the body, that actually goes into the wall of the target organ and meets a very short second neuron which then runs and does its thing, right? So not too magical. But many times, particularly when we're looking in the head, we find that a preganglionic parasympathetic neuron sends out its axon to a ganglion, and in that ganglion, which is a collection of nerve cell bodies, it meets that second neuron and synapses with it. So when the first neuron is activated, it then sends some neurotransmitters across that synapse to activate the second neuron, which then sends its axon off to the target structure and the, the, um, the action potential triggers the response, right? So we have two neurons. We have a preganglionic parasympathetic neuron and a postganglionic parasympathetic neuron. And you can see why they get called pre and postganglionic, because it depends whether they've got to the ganglion or not yet, right? Okay, so that said, how do parasympathetic neurons get to the parotid gland? So the otic ganglion. Where is it? All right, well, if you studied the bones of the skull and you've studied the cranial foramina, um, you'll remember the oval foramen, maybe. And the oval foramen carries the third branch of the trigeminal nerve from the cranial cavity into that region there. So the trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve 5 and it's the major sensory nerve of the face that also innervates the muscles of mastication. So the mandibular branch, the third branch, drops through the foramen ovale and drops down into the infratemporal fossa there, perfect for innervating those muscles of mastication and then sending off sensory stuff to the lower teeth in this region of the face and stuff, right? Well, just where the mandibular nerve pops out of the foramen ovale, that's where the otic ganglion is. It's a small little ditty bundle of nerve cell bodies sat there right next to the trigeminal nerve. And this is one of the difficulties of all of this stuff, is that the otic ganglion is next to the trigeminal nerve and a branch passes from the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve out towards the ear, the auriculotemporal nerve, but 
the trigeminal nerve does not have any role in the otic ganglion, as in it doesn't send fibres to the otic ganglion which synapse and then run on, right? So the otic ganglion does not receive fibres from cranial nerve 5. It receives fibres from the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9. And there's another similar difficulty there, isn't there? Because look, when we... When we, when we get to the parotid gland, and if you've studied the parotid gland, you'll maybe remember that we see the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, drops out from a hole near the ear, the stylomastoid foramen, and runs into the parotid gland, splits into five branches, and innervates the muscles of facial expression. But the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, also, also does not innervate the parotid gland. So we have to be careful. This isn't about the facial nerve, this isn't about the, the trigeminal nerve, it's about the glossopharyngeal nerve, even those are, though those other structures are nearby. Um, so on this model, there's the trigeminal nerve, there's the mandibular branch, so the otic ganglion would be about there. It's not, it's not, it's not on here, but the otic ganglion would be there. And look at that, that is a busy space, there's a lot going on in there. Right, so, I took for granted you knew where the parotid gland was, right? Else why would you be here? So, we've got the parotid gland, we've got the otic ganglion, we've got the glossopharyngeal nerve, let's add it all up and put it all together. I guess the other thing that we need is the pons. Does your brain come out? It does. Ooh. And the pons, this part of the brain stem here, in here is the inferior salivatory nucleus, and that's where we begin. So, in the pons is the inferior salivatory nucleus, and from there, preganglionic parasympathetic neurons leave the pons, they leave the brain stem, as part of the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, and they start running out this away towards the the, uh, the uh, internal, uh, into the jugular foramen, because they're going to run out through, most of the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to go out through the jugular foramen. Now, a tympanic branch leaves the glossopharyngeal nerve and gets into the, uh, the, the middle ear, the tympanic cavity, by passing through the, what's it called, the inferior tympanic canaliculus. Canaliculus suggests it's a little tiny hole, right? So it gets into the, the tympanic cavity, and in there it becomes part of the tympanic plexus, so lots of little fine nerves all coming together and doing various things. Um, and it jumps off that as the lesser petrosal nerve. So the lesser petrosal nerve finds its way out of the petrous part of the temporal bone, out of that inner ear space, or middle ear space, the tympanic cavity. And then of course there's foramen ovale there, this is the middle cranial fossa. Works its way across there, and, and then kind of finds its way out through a little crack to get to the infratemporal fossa, to get out of the cranial cavity and get to the otic ganglion. So it's the lesser petrosal nerve that's carrying the last part of the last part of the axons of the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons to the otic ganglion. Those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons then synapse with postganglionic parasympathetic neurons in the otic ganglion, and those neurons, they jump onto the auriculotemporal nerve, because the auriculotemporal nerve is going where they want to go. Auriculotemporal, this is the oracle, right? They're going out to this region here. So, and this is where the parotid gland is, perfect. So the, those postganglionic parasympathetic neurons run with the auriculotemporal nerve, which is carrying nerve fibres that are doing other things as well, right, just to this region. And then, bam, it's in the parotid gland. And that is how the glossopharyngeal nerve sends parasympathetic neurons to the parotid gland to cause it to secrete saliva. There's a bit more to the story, if you want some. Sympathetic neurons are also going to run out to the parotid gland out here. And of course, um, the sympathetic trunk, which begins in the thorax and extends up into the neck and what have you, we have preganglionic sympathetic neurons running from the spinal cord out to the sympathetic 
chain, the sympathetic ganglia, they start, the postganglionic sympathetic neurons run from there to their destination. And many of them find their way up the head and neck and to target structures by following the major arteries. So postganglionic sympathetic neurons run up the major arteries to get to this region of the face up here and these do also run to the otic ganglion but they run straight through because they're also going to the auriculotemporal nerve which is also going to take them to the parotid gland and is also going to take them to the skin in this region to to be you know vasomotor to the to the arterioles here and uh, so that you might find other neurons passing through the otic ganglion and sensory ones going back and other somatic motor ones passing through, but they're not actually synapsing with the OT ganglion. It's purely a collection of parasympathetic cell bodies. If other nerves, are, neurons are passing through there, it's just because it's like a, you know, it's just wiring, right? It's just roads, it's just a junction without any connections. Anyway, so in that case then, the parasympathetic innervation to the parotid gland causes it to secrete saliva, and maybe the sympathetic innervation to this region restricts the blood flow to the um, salivary glands and maybe reduces salivation or production of saliva and that sort of thing, something like that. Now there's an interesting side effect here. It's reported that people, usually through surgical intervention around here, maybe draining an ab abscess or something like that, occasionally, those nerve fibres of the auriculotemporal nerve get damaged. And if the parasympathetic neurons that innervate the parotid gland get damaged, they, a period later they, they start to regenerate, they start to send out new, new axons to try to repair themselves. And sometimes they don't do a very good job of this and they find their way to the, they kind of follow the sympathetic nerve fibres and they get to the skin and they end up innervating the sweat glands and innervating the blood vessels around here. And what that means is, and this gets called Frey uh, syndrome. And so in response to the smell of food or the taste of food or something like that, instead of producing salivation, well, it'll switch on the glands still, but these new nerve fibers will also switch on the structures in the skin. So there might be a patch of skin around here that starts sweating, or a patch of the skin around here that starts blushing as more blood flows to it. It's quite rare. It does always seem to be related to some sort of surgical intervention. But it's interesting, isn't it? Peripheral nerve regeneration and an overlap of you know, parasympathetic nerves switching on things they shouldn't be switching on. Anyway, the otic ganglion, where it is, the cranial nerve that's really involved in it, glossopharyngeal nerve, the structures nearby, and its function in innervating the parotid gland. All right, we'll try another one next week, shall we?